Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, what an honor to be here with you in Dubai. We have an exciting topic for you today, something that we've been dreaming about perhaps for decades. Made in Africa, by Africa, for Africa. And perhaps I'm going to add one last sentence for the rest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the closing panel at the GBF conference. Today we're going to talk about manufacturing. We're going to talk about the value chains that need to be produced to grow the sector, to increase capacity across the continent. We know that the pandemic has jolted us to think about how we can bring manufacturing capacity back to the continent. And in, in fact, many ways we've been able to achieve that. We've been able to repurpose factories to try and fill the gap that has been created by the crash in supply chains. We've also got the growth and the rise of many amazing African conglomerates and companies. And one such company is the METL Group that is now worth over $1 billion, the largest textile manufacturer on the continent and also in so many other sectors. We also have now our very own manufacturing of smartphones on the continent, Mara phones, that has manufacturing plants in Rwanda and South Africa. We also know that Kenya has been making incredible headway to look at the future of becoming a manufacturing hub. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome our incredible panelists today. We have at the end there, Mohamed Duji, he is president of the METL Group, Tanzania. Eddie Sebora Kimeni, uh, managing director at Marafones, Rwanda. And joining us virtually, Phyllis Wakiaja, chief executive officer at Kenya Association Manufacturers, uh, live from Kenya today. Welcome. An honor to be on uh, stage with you. Mohammed, I'm going to start with you because firstly, we've spoken many times through the years. And every time you've made a commitment, you've made it happen. You've never disappointed. Um, but perhaps if I look back at your history and for many people here in the audience, I'm sure would love to hear the story where your father started a business. You had a family business and it was a trading business. And then you had left Tanzania at the time, but you came back and you completely transformed the actual structure and you turned it into a manufacturing business. Was it economically viable at the time to stop trading? Yes. And, and, go, and, go, um, and, and go into manufacturing? Tell us a story. Yeah. Um, uh, so basically, uh, my, my father had started this business in the early 70s and uh, basically METL was a trading house. And when I, what I mean by trading, in trading in soft commodities, everything from sugar, rice, to fertilizer, and also exporting commodities out of the country. And uh, when I got back from university uh, in 1998, 1999, the country was moving uh, its tax regime from a trader's business to a manufacturing and value addition and job creation. So uh, there was a lot of incentive for manufacturing in country. So I remember my dad was trading edible oils. Uh, I got into edible oil refining. Uh, he used to import soap uh, from Asia. We got into manufacturing of soap. We used to bring in wheat flour from Turkey. We started bringing grain and manufacturing or milling it to um, wheat, a wheat flour and uh, textile. So we do ginning and spinning and weaving and processing, mercerizing, dyeing and printing of uh, African fabrics. So, so we got into a whole industrialization um, uh, business and over the last 20 years now we have almost now 50 different manufacturing plants all across Tanzania, Mozambique, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, I believe Africa in the last 20 years has made strides from being a trading economy to becoming a manufacturing economy. That's incredible. You literally were importing everything. Yes. So, okay, but I need to understand this. How do you go from importing goods to actually start manufacturing? You have to build factories. You need For to get sure. raw materials. Give us a snapshot into how difficult or easy perhaps that was. Yeah, so you see, initially, basically, you know, it was a trader's business. So, so what the countries started doing was started putting in 
taxation that supported manufacturing. So raw material became 0%, semi-finished goods became 10%, and finished goods became 25%. So there was a protective measure that the government undertook to protect local industries to create jobs. And till today, there's a lot of opportunities. So, so we would bring in edible oils in the past at 0%. Now suddenly you want to bring in finished goods, you have to pay 25%. So we decided to bring in crude and refining. And then, of course, you refine edible oil. You get byproducts of palm fatty acid and sterine, and you can manufacture cooking fats and margarines and soaps. So that way, what happened was the multinationals like Procter & Gamble, um, Unilever, who had manufacturing done in Europe or other parts of the world could not compete with us because their products were very, very expensive. So we went into manufacturing, became very, very competitive, and therefore, you know, took a big market share from, away from them. Thank you so much, Mo, for sharing that with us. Eddie, um, this is a new industry in many ways for Africa, but it's the future, right? If we keep talking about mobile phone penetration in Africa, we keep saying that this is going to be one of the reasons that Afri the African continent can leapfrog the rest of the world. But if we're not producing phones on the continent, that perhaps that argument is null and void in many ways. Give me a sense of your value chain. Because I asked you this question at the back and I said, are you just um, you know, assembling the phone on the continent? To what extent are you actually producing some of the parts that go into the phone? And here we're talking about the, the issues that you would experience within that value chain. No, thank you very much. Um, so let me start with, um, giving a bit of a perspective behind so at least you can understand very well where we come from. So it's uh, basically uh, for us as marathons, this is the beginning of our journey. Yeah. So when we look at the opportunities and the, de and the need for smartphones, which was mentioned even in the previous session, there was a need to have a solution in Africa, a solution on the ground. So we, were, we took the bets. It's just to say the need is there, Opportunity is there, but how do we now bridge the gap? And to bridge the gap was to have a manufacturing on the ground. So what we are doing is we produce the, uh, the, the, the board and the sub board, but we still depend on other components. And where now is the challenge on the other side? Because you see, we rely a lot in terms of supply chain for the uh, other component that requires for producing the smartphones, which we are asking now other uh, investors and other business uh, Africans entrepreneur to see it also as an opportunity for supplying us and also for us to supply to them the devices to create a win-win situation. That's incredible. Okay, so realistically, even if you want to have a 100% owned or made African product, you have to you know, take a look at what it takes and all the components that are required. Maybe I should rectify something for you to understand is there's no 100% yeah. African smartphones. Neither there is a 100% Asian product or Asian smartphones or European smartphones. It's a multiple uh, manufacturers that put together different 100%, components. But a lot of the raw commodities yes. Africa produces. Exactly. So that's where I'm trying to see the All opportunity. Right. If you look at the commodity, that's different. You see, yeah. when you look at the commodities, they start from Africa. Yes. Then, since we don't have industries that are developed enough to transform them, let's, stay, let's take an example of smartphones. To be able to, to produce the smartphone, you require the chipset. But the chipset are not produced in Africa. But the commodity itself, start, I mean, the raw materials come from Africa, goes to the Asia, Asia market, which is the biggest, then it comes back. So, yes. Producing 100% is not possible. Not only in smartphones, even in other industries. Yeah. What makes a product African is not being produced 100%. When you look at automat automotive vehicles, a vehicle of any brand is also using tires from other countries. Does it make it less... Uh, but with that, okay, let, okay, you want to talk percentages. I, I want to then clarify this. At what percentage would you then be happy to, and to say that this qualifies as an African product? Because if I think about it from my perspective, and you're the expert here, if I'm just assembling something and I'm just catching the last part of the value chain, yes. 
is Africa really benefiting from that product? Are you, are you producing the right amount of jobs that you could possibly produce? Is that the, the most that you can capture in that value chain? It, it has significant and could contribute significantly in terms of job creation. When you look at it, the production itself is done through artificial intelligence. It's machines that's produced yeah. the, uh, the, the motherboard and the subboard. But the rest, which is the assembly, it requires human capacity. And these are trained staff that are put together to be able to put together different components and now assemble the rest. But that is immediate in terms of job creation, yeah. but there's indirect job creation that is actually created through the supply chain, because it's not only producing the device, it's how do you get the device to the end users. Yeah. And, this is, and that is also, there's a second layer that also comes with it, because it's not about being a box pusher. There's content, yeah. there's software, there's solutions. So us as ma marathons or an African brand, we don't want just to be a box, a box pusher. We want to provide solutions. Okay. And to provide solutions, it starts from the hardware, and it takes partnership with various other active and innovators who have solutions that could be added into the vehicle, which is the device, and provide the solution to the end so, so the hardware and the software, not only the stuff okay. that's mined, right? OK, so Phyllis, great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us um, virtually. You've been listening uh, to two very different businesses, I guess, um, and I want to talk about what you think qualifies as made in Africa. Um, for a lot of you know the policymakers that I speak to, they want to capture every part of that value chain. You know, from that very raw material to the final product. We're talking about processing. We're talking about trying to make sure that um, Africa benefits from its commodities to the final product and the packaging. Um, thanks, thanks for that question and nice listening in to uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, for Africa, the issue of whether a product is produced in Africa or not uh, is defined by what we call the rules of origin. So the rules of origin determine whether a product then qualifies to achieve preferential treatment. So one of the criteria used is wholly produced. That would be mainly agricultural products that have been wholly produced within the continent. And then we have change in tariff heading where you move a product from one tariff heading to another. And that mainly happens uh, through value addition. So I agree with um, Marathon's uh, MD on the fact that um, it's very hard to produce 100% of a product, um, especially some of the complex products in one place. You will need one or two other products from other parts of the world. So the, 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 the need for global trade and the fact that uh, at the end of the day, you do need to accumulate raw materials from different parts of the world to produce a product is a reality. Um, however, there's the opportunity to capture more value within the continent. If you go to the fact that we are, first of all, a primary resource-based um, continent, because a lot of our products are primary comm commodities, raw materials like iron ore, agricultural products, um, oils and others, um, all of these uh, can be value added a lot more within the continent. An example you take is Kenya, for example. One of our largest exports is tea, and only 3% of our tea is value added within the continent. So there's the opportunity even for what we have within the continent to capture more value uh, within Africa. Then there's also the other side of it uh, where you can start production at a certain level. Um, for example, what Marathon said, they probably assemble. But over time, you can do backward integration and start making other products that are required. A simple example, we have some of our members who, for example, were manufacturing lollipops and they were importing the lollipop sticks and making the lollipop in the country. But over time, after their businesses were able to grow, it made more sense to set up a stick, a lollipop stick manufacturing plant locally and then do both of the items locally. So there's room and opportunity to, first of all, capture more value within the continent, but also room for backward integration so that you're able to manufacture more things uh, within the continent. So, yeah, as the Association of Manufacturers that I represent, uh, we've been uh, working on the issue of uh, manufacturing uh, for the last 62 years in Kenya and within the region to see how we can get more manufacturing done within the continent so that we can first of all, create a lot more opportunities, but also provide solutions um, to the livelihoods and the lives of our people in the continent. 
Thank you, Phyllis. I would like for you uh, to get involved in this conversation. We have a poll that we've set up, and we'd like to know which country in Africa is best positioned for a new manufacturing boom. Um, if you have the app, please vote now. These are the three options. It is Ethiopia, Ghana, or Senegal. So the question is, which country in Africa is best positioned for a new manufacturing boom? Ethiopia, Ghana, or Senegal? And then we'll discuss uh, the outcome in just a moment. In the meantime, Mo, um, I want to talk about your competitive realities. You're competing with some of the biggest companies in the world, or should I say they're competing with you in some way. Um, how has that experience been where you are coming up with your own brands made in Africa? Is it about convincing the consumer to switch over to show loyalty to an African-made brand? Um, and do you think that you will be able to take a lot more of their market share down the line? So basically, I, I've been competing with Unilever, uh, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, uh, to name a few. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, some of these international or multinational companies did not have manufacturing bases because they felt uncertainty for Africa. Maybe they felt there was a little bit more bureaucracy, uh, issues of skill, labor, issues of power, but it was a first move advantage. And I went up and set up, uh, whether it may be detergent plants or edible oils or cooking fats or margarines or soaps. So today, now I'm sitting in a pilot position, having majority of the market share, uh, over 60, 65% in each and every product category. So Yes, now what gives Tanzania or East Africa or Africa an advantage? So let's take an example of textiles, for example. To be successful in textile in Africa, you have to have a country that produces cotton. So many countries produce cotton. You have Mozambique, you have Zambia, you have Tanzania, you have Uganda. That's number one, raw material. Uh, number two, you need to have competitive power. Now, if you look at Zambia or you look at Mozambique or Tanzania, I think we pay nine, 10 cents a unit. That equals to what the US pays, equals to what China pays, and India pays. Three, it is heavily a labor-intensive business. So you need to have a competitive labor market. So when you look at East Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, we are quite competitive. An average labor costs $150. So you're competitive. And so finally, you need technology. So we transfer technology, we buy technology from Europe or from the US and bring it. So that makes us competitive than anyone in the world. And then the final is that, that there is a protection system that people bringing in clothing from outside have to pay duties and taxes. So I just cannot understand or cannot comprehend that Chinese would come and buy cotton from Tanzania or Zambia, take it to whatever city they produce textiles, spin it and weave it and process it and bring it back and sell it back to Africans. It just doesn't make sense. And, and you know, we in Africa, I think we're sitting on a time bomb. I think uh, we need to address the employment issue. And these are sectors where, where you can employ a lot of people. And few other sectors, for example, if you look at, for example, the cocoa industry, I mean, Africa produces Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Ghana, a lot of cocoa. But what is the value that they're actually achieving uh, compared to the chocolates that are being sold in Switzerland? Or you look at cashew nuts. We produce raw cashews, we export raw cashews, and we export it to India, we export it to Vietnam, they process in turn export it to the US, while we have quota-free, tax-free, a Goa regime into the US. So these are areas where I feel there's huge opportunities of manufacturing in Africa. If you have the raw material, uh, and if you have competitive power, you have competitive labor, uh, and this is my example, because if you look, I have literally cornered the Unilever, Procter & Gamble. You can only see Procter & Gamble, Omo, in supermarkets. But if you go out on the streets, you will see products that are manufactured locally. We are competitive. 
uh, and of course the branding has taken a while because Coca-Cola has been in East Africa over 70 years. So we have our own product, carbonated drink, the Mo Cola, and we're competing with them. And, and I think by next year I will be selling a billion bottles of carbonated drinks uh, in Tanzania itself. So it's just a matter of time and you need the distribution, you need to understand the geography, and of course Another advantage of Africa is huge population growth. Uh, yeah. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions and in Africa over a billion people and, and a lot of young people, purchasing power is increasing, a lot of African countries getting into the middle income bracket. So I believe that there's huge opportunities in Africa uh, to invest and to get a good return. And just before I close, I think that uh, Africa has natural resources, Africa has, all we lack is capital. So if you have capital, Africa has yeah. a lot to offer. And if you connect the two, I think that brings in a lot of opportunity. Thank you, Mo. Um, I know about Mo Cola, and you, you had put targets in place many years ago with me on, live on air, and you've met those targets, so it's pretty impressive. I'm gonna come back to you in just a moment, but Phyllis, I want you to jump in here. Do you think that one of the most important ways to help increase manufacturing capacity on the continent to make it viable, economically viable, is to perhaps think about tariffs on imported goods? And I say this because during the pandemic where we saw supply chains crashing, I know Kenya had to repurpose some of its uh, factories and many other African countries said, well, we, we had to because we were forced to, so we started producing locally. So what is it going to take? Uh, tariffs or you know, a drop in supply chain where you're forced to think and look inwards? Um, thanks for that. I think it's a mix of both. Listening to Mohammed's um, example, uh, when they started, uh, when we came up with the East African Common External Tariff, where we differentiated a raw material, an intermediate good and a finished good, it incentivized people to invest and manufacture locally because the finished product would come in at a higher tariff and the raw material would come in at a lower tariff. So that's one way to do it. And there's a conversation also about expanding the East African Common External Tariff to be a four-band tariff because a lot of products have four levels within their manufacturing chain. Uh, for example, if you look at the textile and apparel value chain, you start with cotton, which is a raw material, you move to the ginning, you move to the cloth, and then the final outfit or the apparel. So it has four levels. So if you're able to differentiate that and have different tariffs at different levels, that becomes then an incentive for local manufacturing. Of course, the other issue is about um, the supply side of, and, and ensuring that we are meeting the demands in the local market. And COVID did provide an opportunity to see that work out practically. Um, last year when uh, COVID hit, there was the supply chain disruptions that you mentioned. And because of that, we saw our local PPE manufacturing sector suddenly mushroom. So we started from a place in March where no one was making face masks locally, N95s, coveralls, aprons. A lot of them were being imported into the country. But by the end of the year, we had worked with local manufacturers, looked at the standards, gotten them approved at the Bureau of Standards, and people were producing all those products within the countries. So something like that actually triggered um, manufacturers to produce products within the country. So that shift in global supply chains, I think is something that can also drive up um, local production. The other big thing, of course, um, which, which is a reality is government procurement can be utilized also to scale up production. And we've seen it done in countries, even the US, where there is preferential treatment for products that are manufactured within the continent so that they can then access government procurement opportunities. In Kenya, for example, we've had huge infrastructural projects and being able to then uh, make the cement for those projects locally, the steel and the other materials has also driven up uh, production within the country. So all those could be methods that are utilized uh, to grow local manufacturing. Thank you, Phyllis. I want to go to our poll and just see what uh, you voted. Um, and the question was, which country is uh, in Africa is best positioned uh, to become a new manufacturing hub, Ethiopia, Ghana, or Senegal? If I could get those results, that would be great. There we go. And Ghana 
comes out tops. I'm almost sad that Rwanda wasn't included in that, by the way, Eddie, because I know that Rwanda is really positioning itself as um, the new manufacturing hub um, in many ways in East Africa. Would it, are you surprised by that? What would you have voted for, Ghana, Ethiopia, or Senegal, Eddie? Uh, I would say I would be tempted to vote for Ethiopia, okay. as well for the size of uh, uh, the, the country and the potential they also have. They've been a bit shy into developing, uh, to opening up to other African markets, but uh, the things are changing. But uh, coming from Ghana and seeing the result about Ghana, I'm not surprised because uh, they've been, they, is, they had a very much more economy and uh, the potential is already there and they've shown that they have uh, what it takes for, to be the, the right market for it. So Eddie, I'm curious, you know, uh, look, I know what Mara Phones is doing is extraordinary in the sense that you want to put a smartphone into people's hands um, at a cheaper price, more affordable, that's something that makes sense for Africans. Uh, how are things going right now? How are sales going? <laughs> number one. And um, number two, how is the continental free trade area helping you achieve your goals? Yeah, thank you. So, yes, um, for us to succeed and for Africa to succeed, there's two things. It's quality, there's affordability. Yeah. You've just mentioned affordability. When you look at affordability in the sense of how much it, takes, how much it costs to acquire a phone, uh, it will be biased. It's more of how do you access the, the smartphone? And that's where the key is. And this is why uh, earlier I was mentioning about not providing a smartphone, it's providing a solution. We all know that for Af Af Africa to become successful, there's a need for digital transformation of our economy. And you require devices. So what, as, as a manufacturer on the ground, what we are doing, and uh, which we plan to start next year, it's a sort of a membership which allows consumers to acquire smartphones on a device financing model that could be on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, based on their income generation. Then it becomes accessible. So accessibility will not be seen as how much it costs, it's how much are you prepared, are you allocating to acquire a device and be part of the digital transformation. So that's where we are aiming. And I believe what it takes, just to add on what Mohammed said earlier, there's, there's a need also to achieve that affordability, there's need of supporting system and policies to accompany local manufacturing. Because this is what I want to ask you. You're pretty new on the block, right? So yes. what did you need to start this business in Rwanda and in South Africa? Did you have to knock on many doors to make sure that, you know, it was conducive for you to invest this big money? Thank you. One thing that has been achieved, yes, obviously, is the EFCFDA. Yeah. That's the basis, that's the foundation. Since we have now we're not dealing about individual countries. We are talking to multiple countries. 54 countries of Africa, it's not negligible. 1.3 billion of uh, people around the, the, the continent, it's a great, great opportunity. However, is the time it takes for implementation. It's about talking and having the same voice. Yeah. At the moment, I will say we are still shy about the Africa brand. So we need to be prepared to produce and consume our own product. And it's not that just touching the smartphone industry, but it's about entirely African product. So are we ready for it? Not enough, not yet. But it's, we need to go to the next stage and be confident and comfortable of consuming our own product. Then the scale up, the scaling and the size of the market will be justifiable to become also competitive. 100%, one, a market of 1.3 billion people, you'd think would be able to scale every single sector Absolutely. extensively. So Mo, as we start to wrap up, what is it going to take to increase capacity? What are the first things that we need to think about? Um, and potential, look, I'm sure we have some people in the manufacturing industry listening to us right now, and people maybe wanting to get into it. What's the starting point? Policy first, an idea, money, what? 
I think, uh, you know, first, I, I, I'm very bullish about Africa and in specific, specific about East Africa. So let's look at some numbers. I mean, you look at GDP growth, and I don't want to take one year because of COVID or two years, but you look at East Africa as a whole in the last 10 years, I mean, we've been growing at six, seven, Rwanda, seven and a half percent GDP growth. You look at the inflation, very much under control, averagely three and a half percent. Some people are worried about risks in terms of currency risk. You probably want to potentially borrow in US dollars and you're earning revenue in local currency. Currency over the last five years in East Africa has been quite stable. I would say maybe it's devalued 3%, 4% in five years. Uh, for the population, has been growing tremendously and the purchasing power has been growing tremendously. Yes, we have issues in terms of bureaucracy, um, but, but, but we are improving, policies are improving, we're becoming very investor friendly, infrastructure is getting better. So I think anything that you may feel potentially could have a market within Africa or has raw material potentially into converting into finished goods and exporting it, I think you're in business. And, and, and it's my example that over time, uh, I've just been growing the manufacturing, uh, you know, lines in different, different products. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm very positive as long as you have the capital and you have some risk appetite. And sometimes sitting outside Africa, perception may be different, but, but once you get there, I think there's huge opportunity. Thank you. Phyllis, um, if I could bring you in here, and, and here's a question that I think, I mean, we're in Dubai. We know the UAE has been, you know, an interesting partner for many African countries. Phyllis, what role can the UAE and Emirati firms play in helping increasing uh, manufacturing capacity on the continent? Is it something that you've thought about? Um, th thanks for that. I think uh, it's been clear that the UAE has been a good partner of Africa. Uh, and it's been especially visible in the Horn of Africa, where we've seen a number of strategic choices and international policies that are pushing the commercial interests and growing the partnerships uh, within the UAE and Africa. We've also seen a lot of partnership between uh, the private sector, the industries between both countries. And we've also seen investment from the UAE in key, steps, key sectors within the continent, like infrastructure, oil and energy, the telecommunications sector, agriculture, and tourism. So UAE has been a key partner. And for them to continue to support Africa to grow and remain um, strong, they need to continue to be strategic and diplomatically agile, as we've seen in the past. So that basically means looking at their foreign policy consistently and aligning it also with Africa's current development needs uh, through their economic diplomacy and also developing uh, joint partnerships uh, with African countries. There's also a big opportunity as we grow our local manufacturing for us to increase trade both ways uh, so that we then see uh, that partnership continue to grow over time. So I think a good partner over the years and a big opportunity to expand it even further into the future. Thank you. Eddie, and then final question to you. Um, you know, the, since the start of my career, we keep talking about Africa being the last economic frontier, and multinationals are trying to buy 50% of our big uh, you know, companies so that they can increase their footprint into Africa, and it's just always about how the Africa expansion is going to look for multinational companies. How do African companies compete with that? How do we compete with multinationals wanting a footprint on the continent? Do we welcome them, or do we say we want to be our own champions? I think we need to welcome them because we need to learn from others as well and we need to compose with them. Africa cannot prosper alone. You have to compose with others, but it's to find the right balance that shows a win-win situation. We want multinationals to come also and invest in Africa, but we want them as well to come and consume our product. So it's more of balancing the two. It's not about us dislocating ourselves.
Thank you very much, uh, Mo, Eddie, Phyllis. Thank you very much for your insights and for sharing your thoughts with us. This was Made in Africa Part 1. Made in Africa Part 2 is going to continue tomorrow morning. This is a, an enormous subject that requires a lot of attention and one that offers immense opportunity. So we'll continue that. Um, in the meantime, I just want to... Um, uh, invite you to a tour of this wonderful expo. It's 4.4 square kilometers, it is enormous. Walking this is very tiring, this is why GBF is offering a tour and there will be transport available outside the main doors of the conference area, so you can, I invite you to join us uh, for a tour right after this uh, last panel. So I'd like to thank my panelists in the meantime. A round of applause for you. Um, thank you so much. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, stay seated. I would like to um, invite Sangu up to stage for closing comments um, and to wrap up the first day of the GBF conference. Thank you.